this is week two of the Revelation study. And I'm not going to go bit by bit through the letters. You can read those yourselves. What I'm going to do is highlight things on the way by. If you could see my preparation for these studies, you'd see three or four Bibles spread out and resources and texts and uh, internet searches and all sorts of resources because the thing with Revelation is it's layer upon layer upon layer of symbolism. And then things shift. Uh, for instance, today we're looking at the seven churches. And one of the things they start out talking about is the, sa the seven um, la uh, lampstands, uh, which are, were menorahs. Uh, that were very um, symbolic of the temples and, and represented tradition um, in these places. But as you see in Revelation, it shifts to represent the temple to representing um, the churches themselves. So there's some of that fluidity going on, and that's one of the reasons why it's impossible to say uh, A equals this, B equals this, when we go through Revelation. So there's, there's too much going on. So to start right off, uh, we have John addressing the letters to the seven congregations. Now seven is a very significant number. It's the number of luck in um, uh, the Hebrew tradition. Um, Kabbalah picks it up in the modern Jewish tradition. The, um, the Hebrew tradition had its own numerology, and uh, it was called gematria. I think I'm having <laughs> pronounced that word properly. It's gematria. And Every number has, um, or, or a lot of numbers, have uh, a significant second or third meaning. Seven was the number of perfection, of completion. It was the number of luck. Uh, it, was, it was the wholeness. Uh, God created the world in seven days. Sabbath is uh, the seventh day of the week. Um, these, these numbers appear again and again in Hebrew text, in Talmud, in, in various places, and they transfer over into the Christian scriptures a little bit. Not, not grossly large numbers, but uh, the number 12 comes up in Christian scriptures a lot. The number 40 comes up in Christian scriptures a lot. These all have references both historically and symbolically um, in Hebrew text. Um, so we carry some of that with us when we look at the seven churches. There's a lot more than seven churches in that area, but seven was the number that uh, John was going to pay attention to. And the seven churches, they kind of go in a circuit around this area of, um, of Western Turkey that he was looking at. And uh, a lot of imagery is within each letter. And the letters themselves follow a format. There's the, the greeting, the acknowledgement uh, in the church of what they do really well uh, that Christ sees. Then there is the um, uh, uh, condemnation, really, telling them what they've done wrong and what they have to do to fix it and then telling them um, how the Spirit is going to intervene. Are they going to take away the lamp um, lampstand, which essentially means end the church in that area? Or are they special and following the path of, of Christ and uh, doing exactly what they're supposed to do? Now, remember, this is John's version told in the format of prophecy. John can't remove himself, so we learn a lot about John just merely reading what he condemns and what he highlights. And one of the things he condemns is um, a character in one of the cities named Jezebel. Now, Jezebel was the king of one of the ancient Israeli, um, or the wife, rather, of uh, one of the uh, ancient Israeli kings. She was known for, uh, as well as her husband, for bringing in the worship of Baal and Asherah. Now, one of the things to note about the Hebrew tradition, as opposed to the Jewish tradition that would morph into, Judaism is a monotheistic faith. The Hebrew tradition understood there were other gods, but their god was superior. So we always have to have that intention. The Hebrew people also recognized other gods in the in Mesopotamian era area, just none of them were the God and Yahweh, the one who they were supposed to follow. So there's always that tension. So there's these other gods are always kind of around. The idolatry is always there. It's a warning throughout the entirety of the Hebrew scripture not to pay attention to them, but they do anyway. The entire book of Judges is a group of people who come up 
after uh, the Hebrew culture has fallen away from worshipping the true God and devolve into idol worshipping. And then they have to be corrected and brought forth. So this is an issue that remains throughout the Hebrew tradition. And John is bringing it into Revelation. What do we do with idols? So back to Jezebel. Um, she is, uh, of course, as a woman, uh, seen automatically um, with... Uh, sexual immorality. And that's part of the sexism that we're going to deal with in Revelations. It's part of the sexism that is part of a patriarchal culture. We can't get away from it. And it's part of the sexism that John, uh, working with the theory that he wasn't a scene, um, feels quite comfortable in because they denied sexual activity. So it would very be very easy for them to dismiss women, especially women of power like Jezebel was, to as people who were specifically designed to coerce men away. Now remember, this is Greek culture where the whole idea of siren and mermaid is there in the culture where the belief is that, that these beautiful sounding creatures call men to their doom and their death. No matter how you cut it, you cannot take the Hebraic tradition out of Christianity and you can't take Greek mythology out of out of Christianity either. You just have to be able to see it when it comes by. And an attitude about some women, not all women, but some women being intentionally provocative to pull people away from God is quite steeped in it. And there's no way we can ignore that. Um, uh, it's it's a, just a harsh reality of the tradition that we're part of. Um, but it also talks about how women were seen in uh, as a great with a great deal of a variety. Like women were not just a one thing; they were uh, they were involved in all sorts of ministry. Anyway, getting back to Jezebel, she uh, supported Baal and Asherah worship, and uh, she had. Um, use the uh, the government coffers to pay for prophets. Elijah was the prophet during her time who came in to tell um, tell her husband that this is not a proper way to do things. You are the king of Israel. You should be worshiping the Israeli God. Anyway, it, it develops into a contest between Jezebel and Elijah, but whose prophets were more powerful, the prophets of Baal and Asherah or the prophets of God? Uh, so there is a battle, and all of uh, and Elijah as God's prophet um, is the su successful one in this battle, and he ends up having all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah killed, and so Jezebel promises that she is going to treat Elijah as a prophet, i.e., she's going to have him killed. So he takes off, and and we have the the story of Elijah having to hide. Um, carry forth a little bit, uh, the people see how significant uh, the um, Elijah is and how strong God is compared to Baal and Asherah, who obviously do not have the power um, that their prophets try to, to convince people. So there is a return to the worship of God, of Yahweh. And in order to... Um, uh, to continue manipulating and assuage these people, uh, Jezebel gets dressed up with her finest makeup and her finest clothes and her finest jewelry and tries to tempt um, uh, the folks around. Anyway, uh, she's pushed out the window. It's a nasty kind of death. So that's uh, Jezebel. Jezebel is not seen as a sympathetic character in the Hebrew scriptures at all. And so we have that translating into how we read Revelation. So to talk about a Jezebel in the community could mean a woman who was encouraging them to turn away from, uh, from Christ, or it could be a woman who had great power and was speak speaking out in a way that John didn't feel she should or was teaching in a way John didn't think was appropriate. So we have no way of knowing who this person is that was assigned the, uh, the title of Jezebel. But that's one of the issues John deals with. And it's an issue that comes up in numerous places because the, the war for John is the cult, not only kind of good and evil, um, Rome versus um, 
the Hebrew culture, but it's also about the wider culture versus the religious culture and trying to make sure there is purity and there is energy and there is passion within that community and so they don't get caught up in the secular world. And I mean, we don't have to imagine what that looks like because Christianity today is very caught up in the secular world. And for people who who try to have a pure form of religion um, away from all of that, they crumble really quickly because it's very, very challenging to not have that constantly um, being fed spiritually. There get, develops a lot of anger and resentment um, for Christians who don't dismiss the, the um, outside world. So that tension was going on in the first century, just like today. Um, uh, some of the churches were doing a really great job, some of the churches not so much. One of the churches that's highlighted is the Church of Ephesus. Now Ephesus was one of the centers of um, uh, not only the Mediterranean world, uh, the Roman Empire, but also the Christian community. In fact, most of the letters, or a good chunk of the letters in the Christian scriptures were written from Ephesus. Um, it was halfway between Rome and Jerusalem, if you were traveling. It was the fourth largest city. Um, it had uh, reputedly 200,000 people, although that's, that's in question. I'm not sure where the scholarship is on that right now. But it was the center of um, one of the temples to Artemis, who, that was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the temple of Roma. She was the goddess of Rome. She Worship of her meant you worshipped Rome and kept it going. Um, it was also the seat of the, of the worship of the emperor, because in Roman culture, um, after an emperor died, the Senate actually voted them to be a deity, and then um, emperor worship continued with this person. So there was a lot going on in Ephesus. It was um, one of the most active churches that Paul um, established. Um, but for John, that wasn't quite good enough. They were they were not doing what they were supposed to do, giving ease, too easily an, into temptation, not um, not filled with the passion they were supposed to have. So that's something that John wants to um, continue on. Um, and the and in the church in Ephesus and, and uh, the rest of the communities um, were house churches, so it's really hard to tell whether you know uh, church four and church ten the houses um, were the problem and all the rest were put were put together because we can't assume that everybody was doing the same thing all the time. But the structure of the day is really important also. We have this image, of course, as modern people, when we talk about church, the the building comes into mind. So it's very easy to imagine a letter written to a church because we sit in a church in pews and listen to someone read from the top. That's not what's going on in any of the seven churches that were, that were receiving John's letter, or in fact, any of the churches in the first century Palestine at all. Church buildings, as we know them, were not in existence. They had what's called house churches. So they would have groups of people gathering in various places. And a house church is a bit of a, of, a, of a misnomer because you would have actual houses, manor houses, mansions sometimes. Um, you would have apartments. You would have places of business. So they would be either in the front of the store or the back of the store. Um, they could be farms. They could be all sorts of wherever people gathered. That was considered a church. And there was usually a person in charge of that church could be the uh, owner um, or manager. It could be one of the slaves. This is one of the things that we read in, um, in history is Pliny the Younger, um, within 20 years of Revelation being written, um, would arrest a number of people as Christians, and he would ask what had to happen to them. But one of the things that really annoyed him was not that they were Christian. That He couldn't care less about that. It was that there was two slave women who considered themselves deacons, ministers of the church. And everybody else was good with that. For someone like Pliny, who was very caught up in social structure, he could not tolerate slave women being responsible and being given that level of respect. Because in uh, Christian, uh, the early Christian community, everybody was kind of an egalitarian level. Those who with spiritual gifts were the ones raised up, not the ones who had the wealth and the prestige. 
That was not what was going on outside. So when we talk about counterculture, that's one of the things that's countercultural. So these house churches might have been led by their owners and managers, could have been led by their workers, could have been led by the servants. Whoever the community decided was worthy of speaking on their behalf um, and teaching and talking and um, whoever was literate maybe. Uh, and that's one of the things that comes into play with John's letters is that he is writing to all the churches at once, but he's also blessing those who stand up and read these letters. Because while education was quite fluid throughout, literacy was kind of hinky and it was not, uh, reading and writing were not taught together. So it's hard to know who would have been able to, to read this out. But one thing we can be sure of is if he was writing to the head of the church, of the bishop, the bishop kind of oversaw all the house churches. So the bishop would have gone to each of the house churches to read this letter. Um, and that's, uh, that kind of structure is also the structure we take when we look at synagogues. Now, synagogue of Satan is one of the comments that John makes twice. Again, when our modern mind interprets that, we automatically think a Jewish synagogue. And that has caused so many problems throughout history. Um, the, the programs, uh, the Holocaust, all the things perpetuated in the name of Jesus, whether they were political or, or just um, uh, religious or uh, just happenstance and just a good deal of bigotry. One of the things often repeated is this whole synagogue of Satan, believing that Jews were with evil, with the devil. Now, when we get to Revelation, we have to stop it right there because Revelation as we have seen, is very steeped in the Hebraic tradition. There is nothing anti-Jewish about this. The person, in fact, we can't, shouldn't even be using the word Jewish because Jewish was not a, coin, a term that was coined at that point in time. The people who would eventually become Jewish were, were starting to separate from the people who eventually became Christian, but that hadn't happened yet. Everybody was still kind of together. So assembly at the time was a, um, a Greek word, a Hebrew word, synagogue. Um, there was another, uh, another group, Greek word in there somewhere. Um, but essentially, it was a place of gathering. Um, this is a place where you would go to get legal advice, um, where uh, some of the children who had been sectioned out would go for education. Um, where elders would gather and sit around, where uh, political parties would um, probably have their say and try to get, uh, and get attention, um, where you could go to do business, perhaps. But so many things, in addition to worship, was happening in the synagogue. Satan, um, as if you've followed any of my videos, uh, you'll recognize, Satan is... Um, a word that has been turned into a name but never was. Um, in the Hebrew tradition, Satan is ha Satan. So Satan, um, ha is the, Satan is temptation. So the tester, the one who was giving the easy out. So um, in, in uh, John's writing of this, a synagogue of Satan would be um, an opportunity for people to not follow Christ and to do things the secular way or outside of what John considered to be um, faithful adherence. So it is not associated with uh, Jewish folks or Judaism at all. Um, the um, uh, I'm looking through my notes here. I think I've covered just about everything. Um, the text that I have provided for you also has a chart. So you can see the outline of uh, how the various churches break down and how um, uh, who was doing well, who needed to pick up their socks. And then we have those who have ears to hear, listen. Uh, that must have been an idiom in first century. No one is, is really quite sure. Um, but it only appears in the gospel on six locations. Um, three of them um, two, uh, two, twice in each of the Synoptic Gospels. Five of those times are in the telling of the parable of the sower who sows on good soil and bad soil. Um, and then there, the explanation of that that Matthew and Mark give, um, that Jesus tells them. Uh, the, third, uh, the sixth, rather, is um, talking about salt and light in the Gospel of Luke. So 
it meant something at the time of writing because Revelation was written at the same time as the Synoptic Gospels were written. So there's something cultural in there that's really quite fascinating. Um, this, but symbolism, all of it, we need to look at it layer upon layer. Uh, and don't read literally. Um, that's a, a death now when it comes to Revelation. Now, we're only doing a really quick sweep and summary of this. We are not going in depth. It's going to take a whole lot more resources and time to actually do that. All I'm trying to do is give you kind of a taste of what's what. So John starts off with telling the seven group of churches what they've done right, what they've done wrong, what they need to fix. And that experience, that, that, um, that series of letters, the series of metaphors, we can extrapolate that to the wider church in the first century because this is a series of letters that were shared beyond the seven churches. Um, they used to combine letters uh, into a book called a codex and um, they would copy this codex and pass it around. So even though seven churches are named, it's the same warning to all of them. Be aware of the culture around you. Uh, don't worship idols. Um, don't listen to false prophets. Um, identify what you've done right and what you've done wrong. Get your joy back. Get your happy back. Get your energy back. There's no reason for you to lose that. Find what it was that brought you to the church in the first place and get it happening again. All of these are messages to the seven churches throughout Palestine and quite honestly messages that we can take with us today. So that's week two. Um, next week I'll be back with uh, starting to explore some of the deeper imagery um, in Revelation.